were made to dream. Think about it. No one needs to teach a young child how to dream big or imagine the impossible. They just do it. But over time, our dreams have a way of withering under the weight of life's demands, doubts, and disappointments. Sometimes, we stop dreaming altogether. 2,000 years ago, on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus invited people of different backgrounds and beliefs into a new way of life, a new kind of community, and a new hope for the future. The people who followed him started to dream impossible dreams, and then they changed the world. Today, on the north shore of Lake Washington, Jesus is calling us to start dreaming again because he can still transform lives. He can still restore relationships. He can still overcome grief and hate and injustice. Jesus can still change everything for anyone, including you. You were made to dream. And it's time to dream big. Well, good morning and welcome to North Shore. I'm so glad to see all of you joining us this morning. I want to say welcome to those of you who are joining us online. I want to start with a personal question. Have you ever thought about how to get from where you are right now in your life to where you want to be someday? Have you ever thought about how to get from the place that you're in, whatever your situation or story or circumstances, to the place that you're wanting to be or dreaming to be or wishing you could be. Maybe you're in school and you want to graduate. Maybe you're not in a relationship and you really want to be in a relationship. Maybe you're married and you really want to have kids in the house. Maybe you're married with kids in the house and you really want your kids out of the house. I mean, the reality is everybody has got to hear the place where they're at, the situation they're in, and everybody's got to there the dream, the wish, the hope for where they want to be someday in their life. And by the way, this isn't an accident. This isn't just random. God has called everybody to a there. God has placed in the human heart this longing to be more, to do more, to make a difference, to be significant, to have a meaningful life, to exist for a reason. God has called every person from here to there. And if you know the stories of the Bible, you know most stories in the Bible are here to their stories. God came to a man named Abraham. Abraham was living in a place called Ur. And God said, I want you to go from here to there, to the place, to the land that I'm going to show you. God came to a man named Moses. Moses, who grew up in a place called Egypt, was living in a place called Midian. And God said, I want you to leave here and go there, back to Egypt, and lead my people out of slavery. Time after time, story after story, here to there. You can imagine God even came to his own son, Jesus. Jesus, who was with his father in heaven. And God said something to the effect of, the world that we love is hurting and broken. And so, Jesus, I want you to leave here and go there. Life is really about here to there, spiritually, relationally, financially. We're driven by here to there stories. And there is a here to there that God is calling every one of us to in life. Did you know that? There's a there that God is calling you to. And more than just individually, this is true for us as a church. It's true for our community. There's a there that God is calling our church to. For this past few weeks, we've been in this series called Dream Big, uh, talking about where we're going as a church. And two weeks ago, we started with our mission, our core task, the job Jesus gave his first followers, which in our language in our day is basically to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus. That's our core task. Why? Why? Because Jesus can change everything for anyone. He still can. He still can. That's our core task. That's our mission. That's what we do. And then last week, we did sort of a church health assessment. We turned back in time, looked at the first church, the church that Jesus' first followers started, and said, what are the signs? How do you know if a church is healthy, if it's where it's supposed to be? 
And there was a series of signs we looked through. I won't ask you to repeat them because I know you probably don't remember them, but I'll walk back through them. It's a, church, a healthy church is a place where lost people get found and found people grow and lonely people find belonging and hurting people find healing and bored people find their calling. It's a place where love and help are freely given. It's a place where divisions around race and gender and generation are humbly mended. And it's a place where joy and unity are routinely experienced. That's how you know. Those are the vital signs of a church being healthy today. But having a clear mission, which we have, and a clear model, which we've been given, doesn't answer the question. It still leaves open the question, where are we going? What's the future going to be like? What's the picture that we're aiming towards? What's the there? And then how do we get from here to there? It's a question about our vision as a church. And by the end of our time together, we're going to have an answer to that question. Think about it. Every organization has a vision. Every organization that you do business with or you buy products from, from, they have a vision. They have a, a vision of the future that they believe or they want to bring into existence, to bring into reality. In fact, you can sometimes identify the name of an organization just from its vision. If it's done right, you'll be able to know the name of the organization just by its vision. Thought we could do a few examples just to see if you could guess which organizations these are. So I'll start with this one. This one should be pretty close to home. Vision statement is this, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Any guesses? Amazon. Amazon, you're exactly right. How about this one? To organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Any guesses? Google, of course, of course. Google, the one company who's run so well, their brand has become a verb. You Google things, right? This one may be a little trickier. To create a better everyday life for many people. Not all people, just many people. <laughs> this one I kind of bared. You're probably not going to guess this one. This is actually Ikea. Ikea, is, that's right. And the reason it's just for many people is because not everyone wants to buy their dresser that comes in a shoebox. They don't believe that that's the way that <laughs> furniture should come. And so people like me that don't know how to assemble a cardboard box really don't like Ikea. But what if, what if there was an organization whose sole task was to bring a better life to all people? What if there was an organization that wasn't just thinking about better products or faster technology or happier customers? What if there was an organization whose vision was to restore marriages and save families and reconcile relationships? What if there was an organization whose vision was to eliminate poverty and violence and injustice altogether? What if there was an organization whose vision statement simply read, all things new? Well, there is. And if you're in this room, you're sitting in it. And to help us see why, we need to do a quick history lesson because many people today in churches all around the world have lost sight, for whatever reason, have lost sight of the vision that God has entrusted to his church. We have to turn all the way back actually to the beginning of all things, to the picture of the world God created. When God created the world, his dream was that all of his creation would flourish. That's that's why God put the world, the universe into motion so that the world, the universe as we know it, could flourish. And sometimes people associate associate that word flourishing with, you know, wealth or affluence or comfort. That's not the vision. That's not what this word describes. Genesis 1 begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and everything God creates is what? It's good. It's good. And the ancient Israelites had this amazing word to describe the way that God designed the world. They called it shalom. And maybe you've heard that word. Sometimes it gets translated as the word peace. But shalom comes from the word that means to be made whole or sound or complete. You see, God's vision for the world, which is all things would work together and be integrated and operate just as they should from uh, relationships to creativity to business, that all things could flourish Shalom means no pain. Shalom means no suffering. Shalom means no guilt. Shalom means no shame. Shalom is a vision of all of God's creation flourishing. And when God made human beings, he gave us this very particular assignment. He made us in his image, in his likeness. If you know scriptures, you know that language. And what that means is we're now the ambassadors of this dream. We, we carry this vision. We're the stewards of God's hope for his creation. And all the things that human beings were designed to do was meant to be contribute to God's flourishing to that shalom. 
But what happened? Well, we sort of turned the dream into a nightmare, didn't we? Instead of trusting God, we tried to play God and we went our own way. And what happened is that began to spin creation out of control from flourishing to languishing through greed and envy and blame and fear and violence and shame and all the realities that you know so well. Creation went from flourishing to languishing and it's still languishing in many ways, is it not? Even people who don't believe that there's a God can tell you the world is not as it should be. That children shouldn't go hungry and poverty shouldn't be a reality and violence shouldn't be an answer. Everyone knows the here, the here where we are, the here of our world isn't okay. The problem is, the question is, how do we get back there? How do we get from languishing to flourishing? What brings us to the story of Christianity? If you have maybe not a uh, background with Christianity, not sure what the story of Jesus is all about, well, it's about a man named Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago who claimed to be the answer, who claimed to be God. He said, I came down here from up there so that up there could return down here, so that languishing could go to flourishing. That's why he came, that's why he taught, that's why he died, that's what his resurrection guarantees. And the Apostle Paul's language uses this phrase, the first fruits, it's the first taste of the new world order, the new creation that God is going to bring about so that all things can be made new, which is why Jesus gave his first followers, the church, the most all-encompassing, the most audacious vision statement the world has ever seen. It comes in the back of your Bible. It's in the book of Revelation. The apostle John has this vision of God's plan for the world and he says these words, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, see, here's the vision. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And then get this, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Not all new things, all things new. Write it down. Write this down. This is your vision statement. This is my plan. This is my promise. This is where the world is going. You see, the vision is not just to create a marginally better everyday life for many people. The vision is nothing less than all things new, all things flourishing. And what's even more unbelievable is that God then entrusted, Jesus entrusted this incredible, audacious, all-encompassing vision to ordinary, messed up, flawed, broken people like you and like me. He said, here's the keys. (laughs) Basically, he said, here's the keys. When I was 16, my dad handed me the keys to his Honda Civic and said, you've got the keys. A moment he entrusted me with this great responsibility and authority. And I took those keys that day and I spent the next few weeks driving around at about 80 miles an hour just going completely berserk as a 16-year-old should not drive. Until one afternoon when I was driving along and I was coming up to some traffic and I didn't see that the traffic had backed up from a stoplight and so I ended up hitting a car which hit a car which hit a car. And my dad came and found me and said, Scott, I love you so much. Give me back my keys, right? (laughs) Not Jesus. Jesus looked his disciples in the face and said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of God. That is, I will give you the authority. I will trust you with the vision, my plan, my promise. It's yours to now go live out, to be my hands and feet in my world. And here's the catch. There's no plan B. We're it. You're it. The local church is it. No plan B. As goofy and broken as the church can be, God has entrusted you and me, not with holding the fort down until Jesus returns, but with the greatest vision the world's ever known to partner with God and the making of all things new until Jesus comes and finishes what he started. And if if that, you know, wasn't enough. I mean, I would, I would bring the music team back out and we could just sing and worship because that's the there and it's an amazing there. But there's a question, a huge question that still lies before us. How do we get from here to there? How do we do that as a church? What can we do to be part of what God is doing in the world? Well, unfortunately, the Bible doesn't give a 
a simple technique or formula for going about this. There's no one verse that says if you just teach this way or run this program, it'll all just sort of work itself out. What the Bible does, though, is it answers a different question. It answers the question, for whom should the church exist? If we are going to be get from here to there, if we're going to be part of what God is doing in the world, if that matters to you at all, we have to answer the question, for whom does the church exist? That is, who are we trying to reach? Who are we trying to bring this vision to so that through Jesus, God's dream can become a reality? Are you ready? Because as we process this question, it can change everything that we do. There's three great themes throughout the Bible. In fact, if you go through your scriptures and highlight one of these three, three, uh, these three themes, you will basically highlight your whole Bible. Three, ga- three great points of focus that I'm going to walk through so that we can get from here to there. The first is this. We are here for our neighbors. We are here for our neighbors. The church in the ancient world was the first organization that existed for the sake of its non-members. <laughs> Every other organization in the ancient world existed for the sake and the goodness, the feast, and the, the, the flourishing of its own people, not the early church. And they got this because it was a long-standing tradition for God's people to think this way. When God came to Abraham, he said, I will bless you and you will be a blessing. In other words, the blessing is not just for you, Abraham, it's for the sake of others. When God gave Israel the law, the, one of the most common words in the law, if you know the Old Testament law, is the word neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Don't judge your neighbor. Don't covet your neighbor. You can rebuke your neighbor. Neighbor, 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 neighbor. In other words, the law is not just about you and your life kind of before God. The law is about your relationships with others. It's for the sake of others. When Jesus was once asked what the greatest commandment was, he answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he said, the second commandment is like the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Up until this point, there was only one great commandment. Jesus said, no, there's two. Love God and love your neighbor. In fact, according to the New Testament, if you don't love your neighbor, you you actually don't love God. So to get from here to where God wants us to be, we have to remember that we are here for those who aren't here. We are here not just for us, but for our neighbors. So question, you might be asking, well, who's my neighbor? Well, a neighbor is basically any person with whom you can have either relationship or influence. It's not defined in our digital age. It's not defined geographically anymore. People have neighbors all over the world. You can have a neighbor in your neighborhood or on your campus, at your school or in your office, in your social network or with people you know online. And think about the changing landscape of our world for our neighbors. Our neighbors and neighborhoods are changing rapidly in our day, as fast as it ever ever has. There is increasing racial and cultural diversity all around us. I just read that in the North North Shore School District, there are 94 languages being spoken by students today. 94. Our neighbors like us are busy. Their relationships are messy. Their lives are complicated. Our neighbors are also less and less likely to be Christian in our day. Religious affiliation in the Pacific Northwest is 25% below the national average which means more and more people that you meet on the streets or in your office or in your schools, they don't, they're not just not believers. They don't even know the story. This past Christmas, I was doing some shopping and I was in line at a store and it's a really crowded store. There's people everywhere kind of squeezed in. So I made this comment to someone in line. I said, you know, there's, like, there's no room in the inn. And they said, what are you talking about? <laughs> they didn't know the story which is surprising given how early Christmas music is played in this area. It starts, I think it starts this week. You're going to probably hear it very soon. <laughs> Thinking about our neighbors first will change how we think about our ministry. Of course it will. And there's lots of ways that we're going to have to work on this and learn how to do this and figure this out together. That's what our future together is about. But a few things we have to consider. We must go to our neighbors, not just wait for them to find us. We must go to our neighbors, not just wait for them to find us. Someone this week sent me an email saying, hey, uh, there's some uh, teachers in our school, they're a teacher, and there's some teachers in our school that are starting a devotional in the mornings for our staff, just for the sake of pouring into our staff. That's going to your neighbors. A parent here at North Shore told me their middle schooler is starting a Bible study for kids that don't know the Bible, not just for their church friends, but kids that have no background with this book and know how to read it. That's going to our neighbors. 
Some of you were part of what we call Community Serve Day last month where 2,500 people served at 26 schools around our area. It was a picture of the church going out into the neighborhoods and being the church. That's going to our neighbors, and we got to do more like that. Some of you know North Shore has a long history of planning churches, basically saying, God's not calling everybody to drive here. We want churches to be in neighborhoods that need churches, and we're going to keep doing it. And I'm already praying, we're praying as a team about where God's calling us to be next. We have to go to our neighbors. Another way we have to think about this, we have to create more space for spiritual dialogue and discussion. As much as I love to give sermons, giving sermons isn't the only answer. People in our day that don't have the background or the context need a place to dialogue, to discuss, to be wherever they are on their spiritual journey. One of the experiments that we're running right now here at North Shore is an experience called Alpha. Alpha is a place for people who don't believe in Jesus, don't know Jesus, don't like Jesus, have never heard of Jesus, think Jesus is something totally other than what he is. And here's the thing for all those people, they are welcome at Alpha to come and ask questions and be in community and go on this journey of understanding who is this man? What was his life? What did he say? What did he do? Why does that matter? We launched another Alpha course this past week. You can still sign up if you want to be part of that or if you have a friend you want to bring to that because we need spaces for people to have dialogue and discussion. Another key one, and we'll spend a few moments here, we must invest in more digital ministry. Not because community isn't the goal. Community is the goal. But the reason is more and more people are spending their lives on one of these, are they not? Some of you are staring at yours right now. I can see you doing it, okay? Every day, just a few numbers for you, every day 1.2 billion people visit Facebook. That's one-seventh of the world's population. Generation Z, which is ages 6 to 22, which is 25% of the population today, spends nine hours a day on digital media. Nine hours, averages. Short videos are replacing reading. Text and instant messages are replacing conversation. This is reality, folks, and it's not changing. It's not changing. And part of what we have to be really clear about as a church are the dangers that go with this screen-driven life and lifestyle. In fact, one of the best books I know, just for some reading, for those of you who want to think more about this, is a book called The TechWise Family by a writer named Andy Crouch. It's an amazing book and can help you think about what are the boundaries and what are the guardrails and how do we think about structuring technology so it doesn't drive our lives. But as a church, if we are going to get, help people get from here to there, the here where most people are is staring at a screen. Think about it. People today don't just come to a church, they check it out where? Online. Most people that, we con- that, that tell us when we do surveys, I, I found this church first by visiting a website or finding it online. Um, what, we have to ask questions like, what resources are we making available? What's that experience like for people that, that start there? There are people who are connected to North Shore who are not only not in this room right now, but have never actually been in this room before. Did you know that? Sometimes they email me and they say hello. In fact, this past year, we received a $10,000 financial gift from someone who has never been to North Shore, who emailed and said, I just want to thank you for the ministry and for how it's helped me grow through your ministry online. Someone wrote me recently and said, I'm unable to drive to church, so thanks for saying hi and making me feel welcome. So you are welcome (laughs) because they're there. God is doing more than you can see in the room around you. And people are coming to faith via technology. Did you know this? Some of you know Reza, who serves on our facilities team. He's an amazing, amazing guy. He uses Instagram to share about Jesus in the language of Farsi. In fact, two weekends ago, he got a reply, he got 100 replies from a post that he put on Instagram. And then in those conversations with some of those people, seven people committed their life to Christ. In fact, he told me that in the last year or so, 40 people have come to Christ in Iran, Turkey, and Germany, and he didn't have to leave the break room. Just with technology. Just with technology. And here's the thing. If you're feeling nervous about this, there is a historical precedent for this. Paul did not invent the the technology of the Roman roads, but he used it. Martin Luther did not invent the technology of the printing press, but he used it. In fact, the Reformation happened more through the fact that he used the printing press to publish his material than that he had these original ideas. People know the name Billy Graham. He influenced far more people through radio and television than he did just through his live uh, campaigns or conferences. 
So if we're going to follow Jesus' command to go into all the world, we have to invest in and take, and take advantage of digital media. We have to do it. Not to replace what we do in community, but because people will never find their way here if we don't start where they are. And so we have to think about that. That's a way we think about our neighbors. But the Bible calls us not just to be for our neighbors, but there's another great theme. Again, you can see this from basically from cover to cover. The Bible calls us, that says that we are here for the next generation. We are here for our neighbors and we are here for the next generation. And let me be really clear about this. Reaching the next generation isn't just about younger people. If you're here right now listening, you're thinking to yourself, you know, am I younger or am I older? You know what that means? That means you're older, okay? That's just kind of how that breaks down, all right? That's just what that means. The next generation, by definition, is what? It's the generation after yours. So if you're 90 years old, it's a 70-year-old. If you're 70 years old, it's a 50-year-old. God wants us to reach people in every generation. You guys, we had the privilege of seeing people be baptized in our midst today. I just heard recently that someone signed up to be baptized who is 70 years old. And I thought, uh, we want to see more of that. People saying, I want to follow Jesus in their 70s and 80s and 90s. And we need people in their 90s to mentor the people in their 70s that are going to get baptized here, right? Passing the torch to the next generation. God's will and God's way of life has always been intended to be passed down one generation to the next. And for whatever age or stage you're in, the question is always, how can I pass the torch? Who can I pass the torch to? If you go downstairs in our kids' ministry right now, you will see high schoolers and middle schoolers leading our elementary students. They're passing the torch. They're already thinking next gen. And that's what God has called all of us to think about. Listen to how the psalmist puts it, Psalm 78. He writes this, The Lord decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. It's all about passing the torch. I hope you see it. What's challenging about this is that the methods for reaching the next generation are always changing, are they not? Think about it. In Moses' day, God called people to write the law on the door of their homes. That's how they told the story. In Joshua's day, God called the people to stack up rocks and piles of stone so when people passed by, they could explain the stories to their children. That was their method in that day. In the Middle Ages, most, mostly because people couldn't read, they told Bible stories using pictures on the wall. Any guesses on what this was? Stained glass windows. Like this, you can see some of those in the original campus of our church just down the hall. Stained glass windows to tell the story to the next generation. When I grew up, we learned about the Bible using this super advanced technology called the flannel graph. Anyone ever heard of a flannel graph? <laughs> People aren't using the flannel graph anymore. I kind of feel bad about that. I love the flannel graph. I learned about Jesus through the flannel graph. The reason we don't use the flannel graph is it's not useful to teach the next generation. As much as it means something to me, as much as the message may, might still be the same were we to use it, the methods have changed. The methods are always changing, and that what, that's what makes intergenerational ministry so, so challenging. And I'm so grateful this is a five- or six-generation church where we get to take this challenge on. But here's the thing. What worked for me in high school is not working for a high schooler today. It's not. And the burden, here's the hard news, the burden is on those enough who have known Jesus longer, who are more mature in our faith. The burden is on us to give up so that they can learn and they can grow. In fact, the longer you've known Jesus, the more preferences you will have to give up. Why? Jesus said it really clearly, to whom much has been given, much is required. The burden's on us. The burden's on us to reach down to the next generation. And so we have to think about how do we do this? How do we do church with the next generation always in view? A few examples I'll give. There's lots that we can learn over the coming years. A few examples, and this is for families in the room. We must invest in kids and parents. We must invest in kids and their parents. Research indicates that parents are the number one influencers when it comes to spirituality in young people today, which means you, can't, you cannot outsource your spiritual development of your kids to the church. We are here to partner with you and grow them up with you and be with you, but you cannot outsource the spiritual formation of your kids. Another uh, focus, we have to focus not just on uh, programs, but on relationships. We have to focus on relationships, not just programs. 
There's a great book called Sticky Faith. Some of you know this. It's done by a research team out of Fuller Seminary. seminary. And they found that the one primary difference between kids who grow up and stay in their faith and stay following Jesus and the kids that don't, the one difference, the one thing that kind of made those groups, that they could clearly distinguish those groups, was not any particular denomination or methodology or teaching or style or program. The one difference that separated kids who stayed in their faith and the kids who didn't was the presence of intergenerational relationships with other believers. It was relationships. It was relationships with parents and friends and parents and Bible study leaders and coaches and mentors. We often think uh, kids ministry, one to five, one adult for five kids, right? So you can kind of corral them and keep them and keep them from running somewhere, right? Research today says it's the reverse. It's five to one, five adults for every one kid. Five caring adults, believing adults in the life of every kid And the likelihood that they'll stay in their faith goes way, 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 way up. And we have to, as a church, another thing, we have to make the church a safe place for hard questions and doubts. Because young people have lots of hard questions and lots of doubts today. I recently read a story about a 13-year-old boy named Steve who attended church every day with his parents. Every day, Steve was in church with his parents. And one day, he came up to his pastor and said, Pastor, if I raise my finger, will God know the finger I'm going to raise before I raise it? And the pastor kind of said, yeah, Steve, God knows everything. You, you know that. And then Steve looked and said, well, he showed him a picture from a magazine about suffering and poverty in the developing world and said, does God know about this? And the pastor got a little uncomfortable and didn't really want to get into this conversation and said, you know, Steve, I just, I don't think you understand all, the, all this stuff yet, but yes, God knows about that. And then he ended the conversation. That pastor may have been theologically right, but he totally missed the point. See, Steve wasn't just wrestling with pain in the world. He was wrestling with pain in his own life. See, Steve had been placed for adoption as a baby and his family had struggled financially and he'd been bullied a lot as a kid and he was looking for a place, where can I go to bring my pain and my questions? And the message he got from that pastor in that moment was, well, not here. And Steve never again worshipped in a Christian church after that day, never again went back. Most of you know Steve. You know him more by his last name. It's Steve Jobs. And it gets me thinking, What if that pastor had responded differently? What if that church hadn't felt too busy or too unsure to how to handle a hard question or an uncertain moment? What if the pastor said, hey, let's you and your dad and I go out to have coffee or have lunch and talk about it. I'm so glad you're here. Your questions are welcome. And this is a place for people to wrestle with their questions and their doubts. What do you think that would have done for Steve? What kind of changes that could have made in his life? And think of the difference that could have made for every person that Steve Jobs later influenced. The church must be a safe place for questions. And finally, we must entrust younger people with leadership. If you're listening right now, you're in elementary school or middle school or high school, a college student or a young adult, we want you to lead us. We want you to lead in this place. You are not just the future someday. You are the present right now. And we need you. And we're here to partner with you as well. We are here to be a church for our neighbors. We are here to be a church for the next generation. And then the third theme, and you can see this from cover to cover in your Bible, we are here for those in need. We are here for those in need. Jesus only identified himself with one group of people in the world. He said this, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one, for the, one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did for me. And by the way, the early church took this incredibly seriously. In fact, the early church was the most revolutionary force for good the world had ever seen. And that's just historically factual. In the ancient world, people who were sick were abandoned to isolation on the streets until they died. That's how the world worked. Until a follower of Jesus named Basil of Caesarea found a place where the sick, particularly lepers, could come and be cared for. You know what it was? It's the world's first hospital. In the ancient world, being put in prison was basically a death sentence. But as early as the second century, followers of Jesus had become known for visiting prisoners and bringing them food and medicine and comfort. In the ancient world, unwanted infants were left on the streets to die, and children were routinely abused. Children were considered non-persons in that day. But it was followers of Jesus who rebelled against these cultural practices. They took children out of the dumps on the streets and brought them into their homes. They condemned every child abuse in every form. One history na- historian actually noted it was because of the Christian church that children finally became people. That's what the church was doing. 
And by the way, the early church, they didn't have political power. They didn't have real estate holdings. They didn't have vast financial endowments. And yet, they grew faster than any movement in history. The early church grew over 40% per year for its first 300 years, all in the face of persecution and sickness and disease and death. There was no more countercultural force for good. And when the church was the church, when it was on vision, the world noticed. So how can we be a church for those in need? A few ways. We must be committed to sacrificial generosity. We must be committed to sacrificial generosity. Some of you are living this out so well. You give, and then you give above and beyond, and you serve, and you give your time. You ask the question, is there anything more I can do? And I got to say, I'm always tempted to give what I can afford, what I have time for, and what I can spare. And typically, I want to give to people who I think deserve it. But that's not how God gives. That's not how God's generosity works, is it? Most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God gave what he had only one of, which means it was a sacrifice. It was a sacrifice, and we have to be committed to sacrificial generosity as a church. Another thing, we have to be willing to get messy. We must be willing for ministry to be a little bit messy because sin is messy, and injustice is messy, and broken relationships are messy, which means ministry is messy. And during the week in this church, it's not just a bunch of, you know, tidy people coming to have tidy lives. It should be filled with people whose lives are an utter mess. Working it out. Finding a home. Finding hope. Because Jesus can handle the mess. He's been doing it for 2,000 years. I don't think he's worried about how big the mess may be. Jesus is in the mess cleaning business. Which means the church, we have to be willing to get messy And then thirdly, we must pay more attention. We simply have to open our eyes and pay more attention because there are needs all around you that you've just stopped seeing. It could be a single mom in your neighborhood. It could be a family that has certain needs or is in crisis. It could be someone you pass by on the streets every day. Last Sunday, the elementary kids here at North Shore were writing down what they were grateful for in their lives. And one student wrote, I'm grateful for the food shelters. Because there's a child in this building that doesn't get enough to eat. And we have to pay attention. We have to be looking. We have to have our eyes open. Like the good Samaritan who didn't just pass on by because they were on to the next thing. We have to be a church for those in need. So I hope this helps you see the vision statement should be coming a little bit clearer for us. This is what we're going to be about. This is the vision for North Shore. It should be pretty clear by now. It's this. Our vision is to be a church for. And by the way, churches today are known mostly for what they're against. Not here. We're going to be a church known for what we're for. And we're going to be for our neighbors and the next generation and those in need. Because those are the people throughout scripture God consistently calls his people to focus on, to care about, to sacrifice for, to give everything for. Why? So that. The two most important words. There's always a so that. Here's the reason. So that the Puget Sound and beyond can flourish just as God wants it to flourish. You see, this is not just about having a bigger or better church. It's not about us feeling more affluent or comfortable or having our conveniences met. This is about God reaching every school, every community, every life, and every heart. This is about God fulfilling his promise that all things can be made new. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. That's what we have to claim and hold to, no matter what comes. When I was growing up, we would take car trips, and the constant question my sister and I would ask our parents, you know this question, are we there yet? So let me just ask you this as a church. Seeing the vision God put before us and the vision Jesus has for our world, are we there yet? No. North Shore's an amazing place. There's no other place I would rather be, no other community I want to be part of. But we are not there yet. I am not there yet. You are not there yet. Some of you are thinking, gosh, I'm not sure how I'm going to get through this week, nonetheless full of this vision. We're not there yet. And if you ever get discouraged or feel like you don't have what it takes, if if the there ever looks so far away from here that you think I'm just not going to make it, let me encourage you with this, and with this we'll close. We do not count on our ability to get from here to there. 
We do not place our trust in ourselves to get ourselves from here to there. We count on Jesus. Jesus, the one who came from up there to down here so that those of us down here could go up there. And Jesus is in the here to there business and he can do it again with you and he can do it again with me and he can do it again in our church. He can do it through any church that's willing to put a stake in the ground and said, we're gonna be about the vision that Jesus gave the church 2,000 years ago of no death or mourning or crying or pain, of all things new, of all creation flourishing. And though we have so far to go, and though we feel like our world's a mess, and though we don't have all the answers, and we have to humbly trust God every day with this vision, we're gonna stick to it, and we're gonna look for it, and we're gonna hold to it no matter what what comes because God is in the business of getting people like you and like me and our neighbors and the next generation and those in need not just here but from here to there and next week we're going to talk about what this could look like for you to commit to being part of this vision I hope you'll be there with us but for now let me pray Jesus you have given us an incredible vision And I have to confess, I settle for less every day. I settle for my comfort and my conveniences and my future, my well-being. And you called us to be for so much more. And so Jesus, we pray right now humbly for your help. We confess that we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And we're so grateful that your grace still is alive and well in this place, that we still have the keys you've given us. You still entrusted us with this vision, this calling. And so help us, Jesus, dream big and pray bigger. Help us think about ways to reach our neighbors, those in need, the next generation. Help us be committed to a vision that's beyond just this campus or this place or this neighborhood, but goes to the far ends of the earth. Jesus, This is all about you and your name and your kingdom. We pray together that up there would come down here so that everyone here could be with you up there forever and in your name. And everybody who agreed with this prayer said, amen.